Hi, I'm Mark Madison, the historian at the National Conservation Training Center in Shepherdstown, West Virginia. And I'd like to welcome you to another in our series of Conservationists in Action. And today, we're very fortunate to have with us author Tom Benji. Tom, welcome to NCTC. Well, it's good to have you here. Thank you for having me. Tom is uh, an expert on perhaps the greatest naturalist clan <laughs> ever to come out of uh, America. But before uh, he talks a little about the Craigheads, let me give you a little background on Tom. After uh, a tour with the Air Force repairing radar systems uh, basically around the world, he attended college on the GI Bill. He spent 30 years developing computer software interspersed with teaching college two years at the University of Maryland in the European Division. His first book, which we're not going to talk about today, unfortunately, <laughs> tells the uh, life story of football's most colorful coach, Lone Star Dietz, and that might be a, a topic of another discussion. Uh, and then that research for the book uh, led to one about 50 Carlisle Indian School football stars. Uh, and then his most uh, recent book, and the way I came to be acquainted with Tom, is he's very engaged uh, with the Craighead Homestead in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, close to where he lives. And he wrote a wonderful book, uh, the best book out there on the Craighead uh, naturalists. It's called uh, Glorious Times, uh, and it's a, it's a great read about uh, three naturalists, Jean Craighead George, uh, John and Frank Jr. Craighead, um, and they all had extraordinary careers and, and contributed quite a bit to natural history in America. So Tom, can't thank you enough for coming here today. Um, and we're very excited to, to hear your presentation on the Craigheads. Well, it's a pleasure to be here, Mark. Uh, I can talk for hours about <laughs> yeah, the Craigheads, right. longer than anyone would ever want to listen to. <laughs> so I'm going to focus on one aspect of the Craigheads' lives today. Okay. Well, why don't we go to your slideshow then? Okay. Perfect. Today, Today, many people aren't familiar at all with the Craigheads. Right. And so I think it's a little background's needed to tell, to inform people as to why they're important, and they are important. Okay. In 1988, uh, National Geographic had its centennial edition. And in that centennial edition, they listed 15 people that they considered the most important, considered as having made the most important contributions to conservation over the last century. And you notice the names, some very familiar names <laughs> listed there. The Leakeys, Jacques Cousteau, uh, Jane Goodall, and Frank and John Craighead. That gives you an idea of the magnitude of the contributions that they made. Sure. And their sister was no slouch either. <laughs> no, no. Uh, Jean Craighead George uh, wrote over 100 books for children, almost all involving nature, two of which won Newbery uh, Awards. My Side of the Mountain uh, is a favorite among young people. Many young people love that book. And quite a number of others also enjoy Julia of the Wolves, oftentimes a young person will read one of these, they'll cause them to lead, read many more of her books. Sure. Uh, this is a photo of Jean and the twins as young adults out in the Tetons. I've picked that photo because, well, I like the photo. <laughs> it's That's beautiful. A, yeah. Okay, today I'm going to talk about a, an incident, or I should say a, an, almost an era, a, a, a stage of their lives. Uh, my book covers, you know, much, much more than this. Sure. But th this is an important time of their lives. This is an, a time that, in my opinion, helped make them who they ultimately became. Great. Okay. But before we talk about them, I have to give you a little background. Uh, Frank Cooper Craighead, their father, was born at Craighead Station in the house that Mark referenced a little earlier. And at age 12, he became the first Craighead to actually work as a naturalist. Prior to this, the Craigheads were either Presbyterian ministers, farmers, or merchants. And, and every generation had at least one Presbyterian minister. And Frank's mother thought he was destined, in her mind, he mm -hmm. was destined to be one. 
In his mind, he wasn't. <laughs> He's going to be a naturalist. <laughs> okay, and when I say uh, at, at age 12, when I was doing, so, because I did that research on the Carlisle Indian School football players, yeah. I became familiar with the school papers, newspapers. And in a November 1902 edition, I saw a little piece where uh, Miss Paul, with two L's, had been out to visit Agnes Craighead, uh, Frank's mother, to check on Emma Strong. Okay. The Indian School had this outing program where periodically the students would go out into the community in eastern Pennsylvania, New, New Jersey, and live and work with a family. Uh, it would give them a time to become more acculturated and a chance to make some money. Mm -hmm. Agnes Craighead, uh, Frank's mother, had these beautiful flower gardens that the Indian School students helped her maintain. On that trip to the house, when Miss Paul was checking on Emma Strong, she contracted with Frank to provide her items to put in this terrarium she was building in her classroom at the school. One of the items was a hangbird's nest and some other, several other things, and that was documented in the school pro oh, newspaper. Indeed. So in 1902, at age 12, Frank Cooper Craighead became the first Craighead naturalist. <laughs> Literally was in the genes of the, yeah, <laughs> the Craigheads yeah. there. Yeah, in fact, several people in the family have wondered if there is a naturalist gene that <laughs> runs through the family. Cool. Okay. As Frank got a little older, uh, he went to Penn State uh, and graduated. Uh, while he was at Penn State, he earned a, his nickname, which Rattlesnake. He and another boy that were working their way through school, uh, his family had lost all their money by this mm -hmm. time. He and this other boy lived in a log cabin that had a one room log cabin that had one end fenced off with a loose wire fence, and the other side were these rattlesnakes loose in there. <laughs> Periodically, they would milk the rattlesnakes for the venom mm -hmm. and sell it to a pharmaceutical company to use for an antidote, to make antidotes. And that's how he got the nickname <laughs> uh, rattlesnake. It's an evocative nickname. Yeah. For <laughs> okay, uh, after graduating from Penn State, he got a job with agriculture department in Washington DC and started to work there as a forest entomologist. He was, as a boy even, he was interested in insects. Those were the early years of the Forest Service too, probably. When yeah, yeah it was early, and yeah. it was, you might say it was a very, er, for the entomology department, yeah. it was very early. Uh, while he was working there, he went to, on his weekends at night, he went to GWU, George Washington University, and got his PhD. In entomology, or yeah. Uh, yeah, okay. Also working there with Frank in Washington was a young lady named Carolyn Johnson. Uh, her father died of apoplexy, which today I think we would say was a stroke, yeah. and had to quit high school and go up and work to help support her mother and younger children, younger siblings. Uh, she worked as an assistant there in the office but wanted to do more, Frank helped her study for the first, uh, an early, you know, civil service exam. It was yeah. a whole new thing. And Jean, her daughter, said that she was the first woman to pass the civil service exam. <laughs> Great. <laughs> However, she didn't get the promotion. The boss had promised her the promotion if, he got, if she got it, and she beat the men. But he, he later recounted her that uh, he only promised her that just to get her off of his back. He didn't think she'd pass it, well, huh? <laughs> didn't think she'd pass it, okay? Uh, when they were dating, Frank would canoe down to the Pot Potomac to uh, Alexandria where she lived with her family, and he would gig frogs and bring her frog legs as a gift. Uh, not every young woman would consider that the greatest uh, <laughs> gift. At that time, uh, eugenics was a major yeah. deal. So being a scientist, Frank uh, perf you know, went through the eugenics process. He filled out forms on, I think, three generations of both families, his family and her family, and mm -hmm. submitted them to the Carnegie Institution. They came back to, uh, with an analysis and said they thought their children would be okay. Uh, <laughs> they and turned that, out to be more than okay. <laughs> uh, and that uh, the mother would probably bring a little more creative, artistic bent to them. When I told Jean about it, she didn't know about it. She, her response was, 
Well, I guess we didn't turn out too bad. <laughs> no, I'd say they did okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so they got married in 1915 and moved into a house, a small house in Falls Church that Frank built. Cool. Okay. Whoops. Okay. As happens, happened a lot in those days, and even sometimes today, about a year after getting married, uh, Carolyn was expecting a baby and had a child, Frank, Frank Jr. They had all pre-named and everything yeah. in case it was a boy. Of course, in those days, you didn't know if you're getting a boy or a girl. Right. All, something else you didn't know if you were getting was how many kids <laughs> you were getting. That's amazing. She had no idea. No idea at all. Twins. <laughs> and, and after she gave birth to Frank Jr., she thought she was finished. And the doctor said, oh, no, <laughs> yeah, you got to give one, you've got one more coming. And she gave birth to him. And they were identical twins? Yes, they were mm -hmm. identical twins. Okay. Three years later, in 1919, Carolyn had a daughter, Jean, you know, three years younger than the boys. And here's a photograph of Carolyn with Jean on her lap and the twins and little sailor sh shirts. Okay. Uh, Carolyn and Frank were constantly teaching the kids. Yeah. As, and especially on the weekends when they had more time with them. They would go out on hikes along the Potomac. Oh, they lived, by this time they'd moved, into uh, what is called the Chevy Chase section of Washington, mm -hmm. D.C. Not Chevy Chase, Maryland, no. but it's the part of Washington, D.C. bordering Maryland. As Gene said, the city was in one direction from us. Fields were behind us, behind the house. It was... This, remember, this is between the world wars, so yeah. Washington was a fraction of the size it is today. Sure. So they would go hiking and camping and fishing on the Potomac every weekend, and Frank and Carol would point out the names of every plant, animal, you name it, and the kids were just absorbing this on a constant basis. Eventually, Frank bought what they called the shack from a man that lived there. There had been a flood some time before, and a lot of lumber got washed down the, the, the river from upstream, and this man had gathered it up and made a shack out of it. When they would arrive at the shack on the weekend, Frank would race in ahead of everybody because a black snake had taken uh, up residence <laughs> in their bedroom, mm -hmm. and he didn't think Carolyn would be too wild about that. Okay, so the... The, the kids were just constantly learning. And here's a photo of the twins at four or five. Some people think that there's mischief written across their faces, <laughs> which it probably was. Uh, they were very smart. The three kid kids were smart. They did well in school. In Boy Scouts, they became Eagle Scouts. And uh, one of their friends, Gates Slattery, said that everything they did, the twins were quicker, faster, better. <laughs> that the rest, if they're playing King of the Hill, the twins were always up at the top. And they were leaders. They attracted other boys to them. They uh, had a, a gang of boys that, that were just, whatever the Craig kids did was interesting and they followed in. Um, for today's audience, or uh, the current audience, I probably should specify, a gang today means something very different yeah. than, than that time. <laughs> for those of you that are familiar with Spanky and Alfalfa, those that was referred to as the our gang comedy comedies. I remember those. Yeah, because that was our gang. Right. Just a bunch of kids that played together. Okay. You know, so they were smart, but they're also mischievous. One of their uh, favorite uh, pranks was on the uh, trolley car. If you look in the photo, you see that long rod or bar that goes up to the electrical tracks. That's where the trolley gets its power. And barely visible, hanging from it, is a rope, a long rope that hangs down. Well, the teenage boys, you know, high school boys, learned that they could jump up and grab that rope, and if they'd give it a flip, it would cause that long arm to jump off the track, off the wires, causing it to lose power, and the the trolley to stop dead in its tracks. And of course, the boys would then just run. Well, Jean tried it one day, and she was successful. But the only problem was her father was on a car coming right behind it. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> 
Well, that's the only time she did that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the parents were not disciplinarians. They controlled the children more with expectations. Mm -hmm. That if they were, you know, if they just were not measuring up, if they weren't trying hard enough, that sort of thing, they weren't they weren't punishing the children. I would have guessed that from their future careers that <laughs> maybe yeah. they weren't the most yeah. overtly disciplined yeah. children. <laughs> yeah. uh, the father tried to instill self discipline in mm -hmm. them. Cool. Okay, here's a photo of the family taken up there at the homestead at Craighead Station in 1932. Uh, the twins are in the rear. Carolyn's in the middle. Jean's on the right and Frank's on the left, and the ever-present Spike <laughs> is in front, their dog. Uh, he was a very, he played a large role in their activities. <laughs> Wherever they were, he was. Okay. When the twins were 15, they had, they met a man that changed their lives forever. Mm -hmm. They didn't know it at the time, of course, but they went to a talk given by Luff Meredith. He was an Army aviator. Remember, the, the Air Force didn't exist at that time. Right. He was a U.S. Army Air Corps. And he was a pilot. But in addition to being a pilot, he was also one of four people in North America that practiced falconry. <laughs> it was a sport that's been practiced for thousands of years in Europe and right. Asia and Africa, but never here. And he was explaining to the twins how these falcon's wings, the shape of them is similar to the airfoil of an airplane, and got them interested. So, so they started doing research. And they, they found, I think, one ancient textbook at the Library of Congress and a 1920 Smithsonian, uh, art, I'm sorry, National Geographic article mm -hmm. about it, but not much. But through studying on their own, they determined that Cooper's hawk would make a, a good falcon only problem, nobody had ever trained one before because <laughs> right. they're indigenous to North America. So, so the people in Europe and yeah. Asia and Africa had no opportunity to try to train one. So they decided that's what they were going to do. They were going to train Cooper's hawks to become falcons. That winter, early spring, they searched along the Potomac for a Cooper's hawk nest. Well, if you know anything about hawks, you know they roost at the top of tall trees are in the faces of cliffs. Nice, easily accessible <laughs> yeah, places. Right. So, so they and, and their buddies, you know, just kept their eyes open, walking on their walks, and eventually they found a Cooper's hawk nest. So throughout the rest of the winter and the early spring, they monitored the nest. That, uh, we can move ahead. Here, here, here's a photo of them doing some searching up from the top of a hill. Or Okay, in the spring, they, they monitored the, the progress of these birds, the young birds in the nest. And after their last day, well, once they saw the eggs first, and then they just got more and more excited as they developed. I'm kind of getting ahead of myself. And sometimes, in this case it wasn't, but sometimes it's necessary to climb down a cliff to get mm -hmm. to a nest. It's just, okay. Uh, this, so this was June, by this time it was June of 1932 yeah. as their school was ending. And what was going on at that time was the bonus marchers were in Washington. You know, we were at the depths of the Great Depression. Right. People were literally starving. They had bread lines. Uh, I, what, 20,000 or something former soldiers were mm -hmm. camped out in Washington. It was both hot in terms of temperature and in, in terms of volatility. Right. Of it. But after their last day of school on a Friday, they went to the tree where the Cooper's hawk nest was. One of the twins climbed up, stole two fledgling birds from the nest, came down, they went home, they uh, packed the car the next morning and headed off for Craighead Station. Because their father, being by this time was the head, the chief forest entomologist for the Department of Agriculture. Every summer, he would inspect forests in the south and the far west, both for experiments they're conducting and for infestations, that sort of thing. So he would take the family, drive the family up to Craighead Station, drop them off, and then go about his trips. 
so that his family would stay there in the house pretty, pretty much without him all, most summers. His brother, his, Eugene Craighead, was also an entomologist, but he was with the state of Pennsylvania. He worked f primarily with fruit trees. He also brought his family to stay there. So every summer, there were the two mothers, uh, oh, and Eugene had two boys. So there were four boys, two mothers, and Jean in the house. Other cousins and, and aunts and uncles would come and go periodically, yeah. but consistently there were these people in the house. Oops, did I get there, there we go. And this, this is a photo, an old photograph of the house, which the committee has got looking pretty close to that again. It was looking pretty sad for a while. When I asked uh, Gene about the drive up to Pennsylvania from Washington, in, those, in 1932, it would have been a v much different drive than yeah. today. And she outlined the route they took. And I figured that it would have taken a lot longer than it does today. So I asked her about if they stopped to eat. And she said no, that her mother uh, packed sandwiches. And I, I just uh, through, so asked her if she, they used paper plates. And she gave me an answer that I found unusual. She said, she would never have been so reckless as to do that. <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me. I better take a drink of water. And you have oh, and their mother was Scots Irish, as were was their father. Uh, also, uh, Frank and Carol never had a lot of money. He was always employed and made a decent salary. Right. Uh, so th they lived fine. But they were not never rolling in money, so they had to be frugal, like most people. Especially in the Depression. <laughs> right, yeah. Right. <clears throat> okay. Okay, here's a photo of the twins and their cousins playing with their uncle, playing cards on the porch of the house, just to give you an idea what some of their activities might have looked like. Okay, <laughs> this is a side view of the house. You, you can see the large porch on the, that's in the kitchen wing of the house toward the rear, and you can see a awning there. That's a sleeping porch up above. The boys always slept in the sleeping porch because, well, it's cooler there. Yeah. Uh, this is Bill. He was one of the, the uh, Eugene's sons. He, he was the youngest of the children that spent the entire summers there. And the, this <laughs> photo is kind of I inter interesting, but it's kind of important. What it shows the Craig has generally had an owl as a sort of a semi pet that could kind of come and go as it pleased. And there the owl is watching Bill sleep, watching him. Okay. Once they arrived at Craighead Station with those fledgling birds, their work began. Mm -hmm. Their father impressed on the twins that once they captured these live birds, they were completely responsible for everything for the birds. They had to provide their feed, their feeding, take care of their health, everything, every aspect of the, their lives they were responsible for. So they built an enclosure and perches and set about getting food. One of the ways of getting food was there's a barn nearby that the farmer let them shoot sparrows. They had a 22 and would shoot sparrows and they would get mice and other things yeah. to feed the birds. And Carolyn Craighead encouraged her children's curiosity. And one of the ways she encouraged it was that in the ice box, in her ice box there at the house, she gave them a corner on one of the shelves that they could keep these sparrows and other <laughs> things for the hawks. You know, not every Find mother the mice would, in your yeah. ice box. Yeah. yeah, not every mother would do that. No, no. Okay. <laughs> so the twins, you know, had to start teaching the hawks, you know, how to fly, how how to hunt, all everything, everything to do with the hunting thing, because they didn't have a mother there, no right. mother bird to teach them, or father bird. The twins had to teach them, and their friends where they had a gang of friends in Washington, they also had a gang of friends in Pennsylvania that they called the Creek Gang because they were situated along the Yellow Breaches Creek, mm -hmm. which is today is known as a uh, trout stream. 
that runs right behind the house. Okay, so pretty soon you had all these kids, you know, with sparrow hawks or other birds, whatever they could get to lay their hands on. Okay, they, uh, whoops, I jumped ahead to my. Okay, here is a photo, an early photo of the twins with their Cooper's hawks. And they 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 tried to make sure they were both females, and I think they were, but that w they weren't always successful because in falconry, the, the in, for hawks, the female is about a third larger than the male, and it's generally considered to be a better hunter. Mm -hmm. So that's what they they were shooting for. They, they couldn't. This was one thing they couldn't learn from books, because there just weren't books available for them to learn from. So they had to learn by trial and error, by the seat of their pants. pants. Uh, one of the things they learned is that the hawks are like humans in that they have different personalities. Uh, Frank's bird was very active, very aggressive, yeah. and was named, uh, earned the name of Comet. Uh, uh, Frank's bird was docile and not aggressive and didn't really ever work out as a falcon and th mm -hmm. they let it go, released it because it wasn't... Hunter. Yeah, well, it mm -hmm. just wasn't going to work out. Okay. Uh, notice in this photo you can see that they're wearing gloves. Now the you probably couldn't, they probably couldn't have bought, found falconers gloves right. to buy at that mm -hmm. time, even if they had the money to buy them, which they wouldn't have. So they got welder's gloves, <laughs> which are a heavy le yeah. leather. You can't just wear any leather, leather glove because right. those talons will go right through it. <laughs> okay. And the jesses are those long leather strips that you can see hanging from the birds. A lot of times in a photo of a falcon flying, you'll see long strips trailing mm -hmm. behind. Those attach to the bird's ankles and are used to, to tether them when they have them on the ground. Okay. Frank, you know, focused on the, the, the twins learning the discipline to, to take care of these birds, that they're, every part of their being depended on the boys. The boys learned a lot, they learned a lot of self-discipline. Every morning when they got up, they had to do this, that, and the other thing. That They fed the birds twice a day. Uh, they, they trained them. Uh, just teaching the boys, to the boys teaching themselves to walk around carrying the birds on their fists, yeah. they would have to do it hours at a time to train themselves and the bird. And you can imagine what their arms felt like after <laughs> some time right. doing that. Uh, prior to this, the twins probably weren't very self-disciplined, that uh, this activity probably helped them a lot in that regard. The father, being a scientist, also taught them the scientific method. So they logged everything they did, everything, all their observations, as, as a scientist would, and kept a record of everything from the start, everything that happened. Okay, here's a photo of part of the training. This, that, that hunk of feathers and other stuff that on a string is called a lure. And they, it's teaching the bird to strike it. Because uh, the Cooper's hawks they were training, they were training them to go after rabbits, which you normally find on the ground, not yeah. flying through the air. So it's teaching, they're teaching the comet to strike the lure. Okay, now, it, wa it wasn't without a lot of trial and error on both the twins' parts and the birds' <laughs> parts. They talked one time about Comet was chasing a rabbit and the smart rabbit uh, jumped through a fork in a small tree where the bird got stuck. <laughs> and another time Comet was chasing a pigeon flying the pigeon flew through, the barn was open on both ends. It flew through the barn, came out the other end, circled back again, went in again, and then roosted up in some rafters. And Comet just went flying past it. <laughs> so that a learning curve. Yeah, there's a learning curve. Because Comet was so aggressive, she kept breaking tail feathers. One of the things the twins learned was how to imp in a new feather. You know how feathers are hollow? Yeah. 
Well, there'd be a, there'd, there'd be a stub left when they, when she broke her feather. They would take, they said, an old hacksaw blade. I think I, if it was me, I would have used a bicycle spoke. <laughs> but they took and they filed down the hacksaw blade, and slipped it into that stub, and glued it there. <laughs> then they took a replacement feather and slipped it over that piece of metal and glued it on. And that seemed to be worked fairly effectively. Yeah. But one time, Comet broke off her entire set of tail feathers. And of course, they couldn't find a, a, a set to replace them with. But they did find a set from a barred owl. So they imped in a barred owl's tail feathers on this cooper sock. They worked, but it was a funny looking bird. Yeah, I can imagine a tough identification yeah. for a birder in the field. And I don't know if Comet was vain or not. <laughs> Hopefully not. But, but uh, I would imagine when she molted that she would have grown back new feathers. Yeah. And here's, uh, I don't know where they got the color film this early. Yeah, to 1932. Take, to take a, a color photo of Comet. Okay, all summers come to an end. And when the summer of 32 came to an end, they returned back to Washington to go to school. And they brought Comet back with them. Over the summer, their friends in Washington had been corresponding with them. And of course, they didn't call on a telephone. Yeah. That would have been long distance. <laughs> and you wouldn't do that in those right. days. No internet. <laughs> so they corresponded mm -hmm. to keep track of what the others were doing. So, so when they, they gathered up when they got back in Washington and had their perches out in the yard with the birds. And you had several boys you know, experimenting with falconry at the yeah. time. There's a, there's a photograph of the twins and some of their buddies. And notice how the dogs there uh, had to have been trained to stay away from the birds and, to, and the birds to get accustomed to being that close to those dogs. Okay, whoops, I've jumped ahead of myself. Okay, after they returned home, and I mentioned that the, with their buddies, yeah. A newspaper man got wind of it and came out, took photographs, published an article, and it circulated around. People started, not just in Washington, but some other places, started becoming aware of the twins taking up falconry and all these other boys taking up falconry. A Maryland newspaper printed an article, and the reporter there talked with the game commission. At that time, there were no uh, regulations regarding raptors. I was raptors. wondering about that, yeah. <laughs> there weren't any regulations in place at that time. There were later on, but that's another yeah. story. Uh, and all he could come up with was limits, a daily limit on how many he could catch, mm -hmm. which wouldn't be a pro, you know, wouldn't For apply. Falconer, yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, the, you know, eventually the can calendar would roll around to another summer, and the twins captured other hawks, other eagles, owls, and trained those birds and continued uh, writing about it in their logs and journals. Mm -hmm. And more and more boys got interested and they wrote an occasional article and that sort of thing. But they, were, they graduated from high school eventually. Uh, this, is, this is what the yard looked like. Also, the yard up at Craig House. It's like an House. aviary. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, after gathering up all those birds, they, you can see all the different sorts of perches. Okay, uh, one of the birds that they got in later years, later for high school years, was a tersal per peregrine falcon. A tersal is the male. And the male is considered to be inferior to the female. But that's what they caught because mm -hmm. in the nest, it's not not always easy to determine sure. if the baby bird is a male or a female. But they got a male. Uh, they trained him. Uh, and they gave him the name Ulysses because he tended to wander <laughs> when he's flying. <laughs> Once again, they got some color film for that. Yeah. Okay. When they graduated from high school, oh, while they're in high school, to make money. They would deliver flyers and various other things to make money, to buy cameras, and eventually mm -hmm. they bought this car, a 38 Chevy, or 28 Chevy, rather, uh, 
which would have been a, pretty much an old clunker in those yeah. days, because cars got old a lot quicker <laughs> then than they do today. Uh, if you look in the back seat, back window, you can see Spike's head there. You see Ulysses in the front window, and you see some other bird in the, toward the rear of the front window. Well, the twins and their animals made a, I think it was t they were in 10 weeks out west. Wow. That was their first time in the Tetons, and they fell in love with it with the Tetons. Okay. There's a photo of mm -hmm. an eagle. I can only imagine what that did to his shoulder, <laughs> that golden eagle sitting on it. Okay. They enrolled at Penn State. Now, Frank had that job, the father, Frank the father, had the job with the government. Right. But he always maintained Pennsylvania as the home of residence for voting and other things. Mm -hmm. And that way the kids, Gene told me, could go to Penn State as in-state <laughs> students. Makes sense. Okay, so, uh, so the twins went to Penn State. When it was Jean's turn, he gave her two choices. She could go to Penn State or live at home and go to GWU. Well, she went to Penn State. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> well, they weren't at Penn State long when they took Ulysses out flying <laughs> and, 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 uh, to exercise, and they're at the golf course, and he bombarded some golfers, or dive bombed rather, <laughs> some golfers, and they weren't amused. No. So that hit the front page of the school paper. So they became quite well known at Penn State in a hurry. Okay, They joined the wrestling team. They hadn't wrestled in high school at all, so this is a new sport to them. And John said to me that they had to wrestle on strength alone, strength and agility. They didn't know the techniques mm -hmm. we, a lot of the other boys had learned in high school. They, uh, As freshmen, they wrestled 118 means they could weigh no more than 118 right. pounds. That gives you an idea how how large they were. Well, and here's yeah, a photo. Looks like 118 pound physique there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can see they're mugging for the camera there. Okay. While they're at Penn State, they took all these notes that they've been logs that they've been uh, gathering up. Uh, over the years, and wrote an article. Is that one of the magazines? We this one here, yeah. in the bottom. Wow. And they, they, 1937. They took it to National Geographic, knocked oh. on an editor's door, and he liked it. Adventures with Birds of Prey with 25 illustrations. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> I'll let you hold that yeah. up. Yeah, here, I, I've got a little blow-up of it, I think. Whoops. There it there is. There it is. There it is. And I think, that to me, the key part of it is the with 25 illustrations. Yes. Because I think we all know about the quality of f f photography photographs in National Geographic magazines. It's uh, pretty yeah. darn good. Yeah, they were <laughs> off to a good start. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, th so they were not just falconers and researchers. They're also photographers. As we mentioned earlier, uh, that the hawks make their nests in the tops of tall trees. So if you're going to photograph that nest, you have to climb, first find a tall tree nearby, right. near to that tree or the cliff, wherever the nest happens to be, and then climb up it, mount the camera, build the blind around it. And in their, their case, they, have, they put a fresh glass plate in the camera, and, and, the, and they didn't have buttons in those days. They had levers, and they'd mm -hmm. tie a string in the hole in the lever, drop the other end to the ground, and climb down. Oh, to get to, up the trees to make it easier, they found or ob obtained somehow a set of lineman stirrups. But since the spurs on lineman stirrups were designed for telephone poles, and they were climbing trees with bark on them, they got a... a a blacksmith to put longer spurs on them so they could climb up the trees quicker. Yeah. <laughs> I'm seeing future hints of their later adventures yeah. <laughs> with grizzlies and yeah. so on here. Well, in those eugenics papers, their father said about himself that he was completely without fear. <laughs> and my sense is that he instilled much of that in his children. Yeah, I see that in this picture. <laughs> them going up the tree, basically. Okay. okay. Once the, the the camera was set in the tree, they'd build another blind on the ground, and one of the tree, the twins would lay in that blind and hold the string. The other twin would go up and try to find, get in the flight path 
of the birds. And when he, he saw them returning to the nest, he had warned the other twin. And when they thought the time was right, they pulled the string, exposed the plate. Then they would wait for the birds to leave the nest again. And a twin would climb up the tree, take the glass plate out of the camera, put it in a bag, and put a yeah. fresh glass plate in <laughs> to take, so they could take another shot. So it was quite... There was quite a challenge yeah. <laughs> compared yeah. to digital photography today. Yeah. yeah I think people today just can't imagine what that was like. And then, of course, they had to go take the plates home and... and uh, Develop them. Yeah, yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Okay. This National Geographic... You know, we th you know, we, it's what's well, named National Geographic, and we think of it as an American magazine. Mm -hmm. But it's distributed worldwide. After their, shortly after their article was published, they got a letter in the mail from an Indian prince whose name I cannot pronounce, but his, his uh, familiar name uh, to his friends and family is Bapa. Bapa was about the same age as the twins. And he wrote them and invited them to come and visit him because he was also interested in falconry, but he only had something like 24 birds and men with one man to take care of each bird. <laughs> Well, the twins you know, wrote back immediately, we don't have any money, we can't. <laughs> right. And they invited him to come. Well, he didn't have any money either. <laughs> However, his older brother, the, you know, he was, Bapa was just a Raja, mm -hmm. but his older brother was the Maharaja. <laughs> he had the money. He also had a private army <laughs> because this was pre-partition India. Right. It's a very different world. And Bapa's brother, had to come to New York for some reason, so Bapa was able to tag along. And when the twins wrote Bapa to tell him that he was invited to come down and visit and everything, their mother put, up, put on one stipulation. He can bring no servants because their house in Washington was modest. Yeah. And, uh, and this was a, probably the first time in Bapa's life that he lived without <laughs> servants. But pretty soon he was he accustomed he got accustomed himself to yeah. doing what the twins were doing and enjoyed it. Okay, when he got well, then they short after a short time in Washington, they went up to Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. The the neighborhood girls found him quite mm -hmm. interesting and attractive. Uh, he was invited to paint his coat of arms on the kitchen wall. Uh, there's a photograph of mm -hmm. him with Bill. This is the same little boy that was sleeping watching the owl. Yeah. And I think that's a, 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 a sparrow hawk, but today is a kestrel. Called, I'll give you an idea what Bapa looked like. And there, there they are. Uh, Frank, <laughs> um, Frank, and I'm sorry, John Craighead uh, labeled this as the Connor to win it, but people locally think for sure that was yellow breeches. And there you go with those fish. It looks like they had a pretty good day. Yeah, I'll say. And there, there is his <laughs> coat of arms painted on the kitchen wall. Which still exists. Yeah, still there. Yeah, I, I took that photo. Uh, you, and you get an, an idea from looking around. It's not the only thing painted on those walls. But that's a story for another day. <laughs> okay. Shortly after graduating from Penn State, the twins took all of their f notes, because they continued taking notes even after uh, publishing the article, and wrote a book uh, that they called Hawks in the Hand. Hawks in the Hand here. And This looks like a first edition. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's it certainly it, an older one. Yeah, yeah that, that is the first edition. That's and great. On, that's a photograph of Ulysses on the cover. Oh, wow. How many times do raptors get to be the cover <laughs> yeah, image not, with a name. <laughs> other than the Maltese Falcon, I'm not sure. So that's their first book. Yeah, that's their first, that's the twins' first book. And it remains an important book because if you talk to people, to current day falconers, they were inspired by that book, their art, the twins' article, or Gene's book, My Side of the Mountain, yeah. or, or more than one of those. The, Neat. That the Craig has a really or with the impetus, is, you might say they're the ones who, who uh, midwifed falconry in the country. I had no idea. As, as young boys. Uh, whoops, I jumped ahead of myself again. You'll have to excuse me for that. After 
you know, that summer between uh, their getting their bachelor's degrees and starting grad school, they published this book. That fall, they enrolled at Michigan into a master's program. And they made short work of that and graduated you know, from that. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, they arranged with National Geographic to make a trip to India to visit <laughs> Mapa. And uh, National Geographic grub staked them to a tune of about $3,000, much of which was in color, both still and movie film for that trip. And you have to think, 1940, yeah. $3,000 is a lot of money. <laughs> it is. <laughs> well, they caught a, uh, what would you call it? Not a tramp steamer, it was a freighter. freighter. A freighter out of San, San Francisco to, uh, to go west to get to India through all sorts of places and finally landing in India. But on the way, they stopped in the Tetons to visit. Ah. And this is a photo of Margaret Smith, who some years later became Mrs. John Craighead. Uh, she set some mountain climbing records, records in the Tetons. She was very, very quick. Her nickname was Coney because that's some sort of squirrel sort of animal out there that can zip in and out of crevices in the rocks. What do you notice about her uh, protective equipment? <laughs> yeah, there's none, basically. <laughs> I think she's wearing, what, a, a cotton pl plaid shirt, yeah. some dungarees, Looks and like some like a good kids. match for the <laughs> John. Yeah. Like they say, that's when men were men and women were women. <laughs> Here's a photo they took in India with Bapa calling his tersel to the lure. Uh, this is a photo of uh, one of the twins with one of Bapa's men and his hawk and a bird. Uh, and that's this book. Uh, yeah. Life with an Indian Prince by John and Frank. <laughs> yeah. Where'd you find this book? Oh, <laughs> yeah. Well, I can't believe it was. Well, it's on, beautifully. Well, on on Amazon, I found two reviews for that book. Oh one one review uh, said it's the best book ever written. <laughs> <laughs> what did the other one say? And the other one said, for an interesting vacation, buy this book. It was list. <laughs> the price was like one hundred and twenty dollars. Wow. What? It's got what, gorgeous illustrations. Yes, yeah, full color pictures. <laughs> yeah. uh, what I did was, knowing that I would probably abuse the book, I called the publisher and asked them if they had any uh, damaged you know, defects. And sure enough, they did. They had it. So that saved me some money. I was able to buy one. <laughs> one, of, one of the signatures in the book is upside down. So, so when you get to this one clump of pages, you have to turn the book over. But it, it is a wonderful book. Yeah, yeah. And it, it chronicles their trip to India, both in photographs Plus, in, uh, in their notes, they, day by day, what they did. It was a really interesting uh, book. And, of course, they wrote a National Geographic article from it. Okay. There's, uh, one of the th activities was going to a wedding. And, and when a prince in India got married at that time, they just didn't have a wedding ceremony. You know, they you know, went on a hunt with birds. They went on a lion hunt on elephants. I mean, it was, we just can't imagine <laughs> what they did. And of course, they were given uh, appropriate clothing for that. Okay, when it was time to return, they were gone about eight months. They were planned on retracing their steps. But, you know, in 1941, Japan and mm -hmm. was, had been fighting in China a good while, and things were pretty hot in that right. part of the world. Uh, so they came back the other way. They, they headed, sailed west from there to come to Boston. Before they arrived in Boston, the Navy commandeered the ship they were on and rerouted it to New York, to, I guess, to get everybody off of it. Yeah. That was fine for the twins because it was closer to home. Well, that fall, that was you know, September of 41, they enrolled at Michigan, University of Michigan, in a Ph.D. program. They needed to be able to support themselves there. They got some scholar uh, assistantships, I guess you'd call them, and they got a teaching job. Uh, whoops, there, there. 
up the uh, the uh, oh let's give you the sad news first. yeah i see poor yeah. ulysses yeah, R.I.P. Yeah, <laughs> yeah yeah they they brought a ulysses to uh their friend morgan berthrong took care of ulysses while right. they were in india but when they returned they took him to michigan with them and they kept him in a lab in a cage and a classmate another grad student had a weasel and he left the latch open on the weasel's cage. Oh, they wanted to kill him, with good reason. <laughs> I mean, it's really sad. Yeah. That, that, that hurt them a lot, losing Ulysses. Okay, well, grad students had a lot more wildlife yeah, <laughs> in the dorms yeah, than when I was a grad yeah. student. Well, this was in the lab. They, oh, in the lab, they okay. They kept it in the lab. But you pr they probably had <laughs> lost, you know, a lot of other things in the dorms. Uh, to, raise, to, to help support themselves, uh, they had to teach a course. Well, the U.S. wasn't in the war yet. In fact, a year earlier, in 1940, sensing that we we're going to be going to war, right. the government instituted a draft. And shortly, the military found out that the men, being young men being drafted, were not in good enough physical condition uh, for military service. So they cajoled all the colleges and or most of the colleges and universities to step up their physical education programs to make them more rigorous. Well, the twins were assigned the job of teaching PEM 39, physical education for men, course number 39, yeah. which uh, the students sarcastically called the commando course because it was so difficult. Also, uh, on one night hike, a student fell into a bog. I didn't know <laughs> Ann Arbor, Michigan had bogs, but apparently it does. Uh, it was you know, written up in the school papers and what have you, but it was effective. Well, the twins tried to market their course, figuring that some government agency might want it, but none took them up on it. So uh, their friends from Penn State a number of them, the whole ski team, for example, joined the, Pen the 10th Mountain Division yeah. in mass. And the twins were arranging to join with them. But just before they were to leave, the Navy conscripted them and, and uh, what's the word for an officer? Ma made them, uh, commissioned them, commissioned them as ensigns mm -hmm. and assigned them the task of developing a wilderness survival school for downed pilots at uh, Chapel Hill, North Carolina. That's where the Navy trained their pilots. So during the war, the twins uh, were training the Navy pilots how to survive wherever they happened to crash or parachute to, which could be on a jungle island in the Pacific, it could be in Alaska, yeah. or it could be almost anywhere. So. It, they, they wrote Is that a the book. source of this book? Yes. <laughs> How to Survive on <laughs> Land and Sea, Aviation Training, Office of the U.S. Navy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's the first edition of that book, and it was published by the Navy. Wow. So their names aren't listed as authors in the book. Their photographs are in it. Uh, but all the succeeding editions were under their name. And I, it, was in, it, it was in print for a number of decades. It's a great I just opened it at random, and here's a... Uh, looking for grubs and rotten logs. <laughs> so this was this was intense. Yeah. <laughs> Keeping your eyes open for cormorant eggs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so on. Yeah. <laughs> That's a great book. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, their friends, the Maslins, back in Pennsylvania, had a factory that made automobile carpet. But during the war, there was no market for automobile parkets, so they made canvas ducking. And, they, and the Maslins provided them their, their tents, their backpacks, all they, the sorts of equipment they needed. And I was fortunate enough to be made the gift of a book that they uh, gave, inscribed to Frank Maslin. Okay, the purpose of this talk is to really show people how much young people can accomplish. People yeah. of ordinary means, not wealthy, right. not entitled people, but just ordinary kids if they put their minds to it, if they use their wits and are dedicated. That's important, their yeah. early introduction to nature. And it's a, it's a great episode. And in fact, you know, we've studied the Craig Eds here for two decades, and I don't think I knew any of this history. <laughs> <laughs> the importance of the role in 
early American falconry, visiting India, uh, their role in the Navy. That, that was a great start. We've only got a few minutes left, okay. and we do have to ask you, as a Craighead expert, what can you tell us about their radio collar and grizzly bears, <laughs> which okay. is our famous picture in the cafeteria. Okay, that's, <laughs> let me get a drink. Well, uh, this would have been in the early 50s. Mm -hmm. uh, John was situated in Missoula, Montana, doing something with the university there. And Frank had moved to uh, uh, Boiling Springs, Pennsylvania which is near their homestead, but yeah. not, I mean, but not far. Right. It was down the creek. It's also on the Old Reaches Creek. Their father had bought it as a retirement home, but by the mid-50s, their father wanted to spend his entire retirement in Florida. He didn't want any cold weather, weather anymore. So Frank Jr. and his family were living in that stone house in Boiling Springs. John got a grant to study the grizzly bears in Yellowstone Park. Nobody had studied grizzly bears before. There's just no data on them. Well, when you think about it, how easy would it be to get data on grizzly bears? Right. You know, they're not like bunny rabbits. You can't pick them up. <laughs> no. Then, you know, they move fast. Uh, they're big. They're nasty. Yeah, they're dangerous. <laughs> they're very dangerous. So as they were pondering that, Frank Jr. was talking with a friend of his from Carlisle named Hoke Franciscus. Hoke worked in Cronenberg's menswear store, but he was a ham radio enthusiast as, as his hobby. The two of them rigged together a radio transmitter and then a receiver, and the transmitter they rigged up on a collar that they could mount on the bear. Well, so far so good. They, they put the collar on some of the kids, and the kids would run or bicycle around, and they would tr track them and to test it out. Right. But putting a collar on a kid is one thing. <laughs> putting it on a grizzly bear is right. an entirely different matter. So they contracted, contacted their friend Morgan Th Berthrong, who was then a medical doctor and who was, uh, knew about anesthesia. So Morgan worked up some estimated dosages and the types of anesthesia to try on the bears. And they, they made these traps, these big, I guess, out of a culvert. But that they, where they would trap the bears, and when the trap, when the bear was in the trap, they would shoot it with a dart to put it to sleep. Then they would take it out and weigh it and measure it and tag the ears and all that sort yeah. of thing, record all that data. And when they were done with that, then they would give it a shot of an antidote to wake it up. Well, eventually that worked pretty well. <laughs> Eventually. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there was a, a significant learning curve with that, as you can imagine. Yeah. And if you go out to YouTube and uh, query on Craighead and Grizzly, you'll find a little uh, clip of uh, one of their experiments while they were learning about this process. Well, you gave us a good background on how they became adventurous enough to even attempt <laughs> to be the first to radio collar <laughs> grizzly bears. Yeah. Tim, we're just about out of time. Thank you so much. This was really, really fun, and uh, um, it was a great introduction. Do you want to leave us with any last thoughts about the, uh, Tom, why did I call you Tim, sorry, <laughs> Tom. Uh, any last thoughts or, or favorite anecdotes out of glorious times, the, the life of the Craighead naturalist? Well, when they were kids, one of the things, you know, they swam in the creek a lot. Yeah. In 1933, there was a big flood, and there was an uh, there is still there an iron bridge, that rumor had it, or legend had it, and I couldn't I could never verify that this happened. The people all said, well, they could have done it. <laughs> was it's one of those iron truss bridges, yeah. and it was Bill Coyle told me that the twins would race each other over the top of it on their hands, walking <laughs> hands over the top. Of it. In 1933, when there was a flood. They and their sister and, and other kids would got on that bridge because the water was almost up to it, right. and they jumped into this raging stream. And when they got to the railroad bridge that's on the property, they had had to dive underwater to keep from getting slammed up against the side of the bridge. And, and the creek makes a 90-degree bend right after that railroad bridge. 
And fortunately, there is uh, some tree roots sticking out that they would, they would reach out and grab those roots and pull themselves out of the creek. Otherwise, they would end up in boiling springs. And then they would run back and do it again. <laughs> That's a great story. They were adventurers, <laughs> sure. Uh, we spent a very quick hour with Tom Benji. His book is Glorious Times, Adventures of the Craighead Naturalist. It's a wonderful um, depiction, not only of Gene Craighead, Frank and John, but also their parents and uh, their homestead and the importance of being outdoors in nature on their, their later careers. So I strongly recommend it. I really appreciate you giving us some background on their formative teenage yeah. years. And this was really fun. So thanks a lot, Tom. Well, thank you for having me.